What's up, everybody? Welcome to Kinda Funny Games Daily for Wednesday, November 1st. Oh, it's November 2017. Oh I'm one of your hosts, Greg Miller, alongside Rogue One's Gary Witta. Hello! Thank you for coming back, Gary Am I Witta. always going to be Rogue One? I have to come up with something new so I, I can be something... Well, you've done a bunch of other stuff. I mean, stuff. obviously, I'm not complaining, but... Sure. You've done a bunch of stuff in your career, obviously. But Rogue One is, would be considered the, the best note. You're actually in the Roper Report today, which is interesting. I, I don't know, think we've ever had... That? Oh, I forgot my... I left my notes on your we'll desk. We'll get your, your own notes, all right? Because you have, first... You have, is there like a, a, an FNG that can go get those for me? No, well, Joey, Joey's just a nice nice woman. Just, or, or a nice person. Yeah, Joey's just going to do it. I don't think I have to be the FNG business of it. Um, how I'm are the FNG, if any anything are you yeah, well that's the, the thing let's let's just nip this in the bud two weeks ago gary would have comes on kind of funny games daily he does a great job the next day andy cortez decides he hates his job doesn't come into work i have to call uh, gary would back and well, say hey gary would clearly saw me he's like thought can't, can't compete with that i can't compete with that so then we get two Thank shows you. with gary would rogue ones gary would book of eli's Gary Widow. We get two shows back to back with him. Everybody on the subreddit, everybody in the forums, everybody in the YouTube comments. Gary Widow's great. Gary Widow's great. Hire Gary Widow to reply. Man, I don't go to those. I, maybe I should start visiting. No, these. you don't. You'll get a big head. Go hire him to replace Danny. Make <laughs> make Gary Widow one of the kind of funny uh, so games. The public daily. response was 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 favorable. They liked you, and they all started knocking on my door, knocking on my Twitter to get you to come in here permanently to have you be a reoccurring person. Ladies and gentlemen, this man wrote Rogue One. Co-wrote. Co-wrote Rogue One. He worked on The Walking Dead. He's going to work on The Walking Dead again. We'll get to that. He's got a Star Wars book out right now. He's writing yeah. Rebels episodes and all stuff. Gary Witta is does not have time to come in and do Kind of Funny Games daily on a regular basis. Oh, I have time. You do? I mean, it's what, an hour a week? It's my lunch. And it's, a lunch. it's essentially my lunch hour. Oh. So it's a nice, I, I, part of the reason why I've enjoyed doing it, it's a nice way for me to get out of the house. I'm a homebody. My wife said, you got to get out of the house more. Please, God get out of the house more and i said well you know i've been doing the kind of funny thing i don't know if it's like a regular gig but like, i enjoy going in whenever um but no i, I could i could you, what you want me to come in like once a week or something you want to make it, it official do you want to come yeah, in once not? a week you want to be a, you want to be an official kind what of funny game when you want to say like host? every wednesday or coming with a wednesdays coming with a wednesday like, you, wednesdays? You, this is why you are a media baron That's this is why you are you presided <laughs> over this, I am the, this, I am, right. this media empire i'm the rockefeller of this you've thing you've taken kind of funny from a nickel and dime outfit to what? Like at least like quarters and an actual whole dollars at this, this is, point. See, I like it. You, 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 it's been mere seconds of you being an employee of kind of funny. Look at you. You already, you already complimenting the boss, man. That's I like right. That I know. I know how to climb up the the ladder of success here. Is Brown knows the the boss, ladies and gentlemen. So is this happening? Is this is, is it's this official? Ha is this happening live? Is, you tell me. Is it happening? I'm, Are you I'm, you're you're officially a host now? We have to pay you, and you come in every Wednesday. You're gonna pay me. We're gonna pay you. Oh my god, you could have got away with not paying me. Damn, right, we'll talk about that after the this. show. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Witt is your new. Yeah. Kind of funny games daily show host. Yeah. Widow Wednesdays. Widow Wednesdays. Until inevitably Unless, we like, have to Wednesday, move <laughs> like something more important comes along, and then I'll do something else. Sure, exactly. But well, yeah, we'll say okay. Yeah, let's do it. Widow Wednesdays. Beauty, begin now. That's the beauty of kind of funny games daily is that we have a good stable of hosts, so people can move around. You but have what a I, conflict. But on what Wednesday. I also boom. like about it is like how nimble you are. Like you just made a major business decision. Just like boom. That's what I do. You extemporaneously, know what I mean? just on the air. Like it's just done. Well, you see, we have a big contingent of European fans over there. You do. So they were. Really Really stoked when we had Danny O'Dwyer here with his lovable Irish bro. You yes, know what I mean? Yes. And then when we lost him and started going too American, you feel they like you were some more cosmopolitan. They were very much like, hey, you know what? Let's diversity. get somebody else with an accent in here. Yeah. And then you so came you in. A little Euro, Euro flavor. You made this folk hero speech against EA last time you were oh here, God, and everybody yeah. was like, this was, is the man. Yep, okay. They started painting your posters all over the wall. You're you're the voice <laughs> of the consumer now, you know? It's big business, Greg Miller. Well, no, I, I still, you know, it, I, it's been a long time since I was on the, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, when I was editing PC Gamer and other magazines, I used to be on that free game gravy train. Oh, sure. That's, I, that's you know, why you want to work with us. Well, the reality, <laughs> I mean, the, the sad thing about it is you do kind of lose touch with what it's like to go out and spend money for games mm -hmm. and play True. a game and like, be disappointed. And that, and, but the part that really kicks is like, I spent 50 bucks for this. Yeah. And it sucks. I'm really, I feel kind of burned by it. And you, it is easy to lose touch with that when you don't have to do that anymore. And I've been, you know, so I've been uh, back buying games and, you know, just being like Johnny Consumer for a long time now. So yeah, I like to feel like I've, I've rediscovered um, what it's like to just 
be a person you know playing and and paying for and standing in line for video games like all the other. Well, see, that's what I love uh, about you in the in people. the shows you've done with us. In just knowing you is obviously a friend too throughout the years. Is the fact that to this show you bring such a great perspective that so many of you know like Andrea and me and Tim and Andy we're all in the same uh, system of where we are right now in our careers, right? Whereas you did the whole PC mag thing. You went off. You start writing movies and games. Then you're playing games, but you know the industry from both this consumer and development side that I think is fascinating. Thank you. Well, I'm, you I, listen, I'm, this is great. I'm happy to be, uh, happy to be, be a board. All right, cool. Do I, does this, act, this doesn't mean that you're my boss though, right? Oh yeah, no, it totally it does. does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For one day a week, just Widow Wednesdays. For, okay. All right. Okay. This will be good. I, right. I, I need somebody to keep my, keep me in check. Good. <laughs> I need somebody to keep complimenting me. If you didn't know, this is Kind of Funny Games Daily. Each and every weekday on a variety of platforms, we run you through the nerdy video game news you need to know about before giving you perspective, opinions, <coughs> reading your questions, answering them, sometimes giving you bad PSN names, but mainly having a great time. If you like that, you can watch live on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames, but we don't check the chat. If you want to have a question read, you got to write in to kindoffunny.com slash kfgd. You can do it anytime no matter when you're watching the show. However, if you want to correct us live, which we need you to do if you're watching on Twitch, go to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. Tell us what we screw up as we screw it up so we can set the record straight for everybody watching later on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames and listening on podcast services around the globe. I'm going to go for another perfect game today. N no no like, corrections? Like I'm sure we'll, like whatever your wrongs come in at the end. Sure, they'll just I, be like, on me. Directed solely at you. Perfect. People Thank will you. not be able to find Go ahead and flaws. stack the deck. Yeah, go any ahead flaws. and keep going that way. We'll see. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm, we will see. Uh, housekeeping for you. There's a new party mode up right now on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames. It's part two of Friday the 13th. Nick is Jason. That, of course, also means there's a new party mode up on patreon.com slash kind of funny games for a dollar you can get next week's party mode now and then saturday we are streaming video games all day long 24 hours to raise money for extra life if you want to donate or be part of the stream please go to kind of funny.com slash extra life help us help the big beautiful kids so i'm going to come in for that too on saturday sure, we'll you better out, that's, a, we'll that's all a hands on deck kind of funny thing we'll figure out a time for me to come in sure and uh, I definitely want to pitch in. What do you want to play? What are you going to do? Well, I don't, I, I don't know. Do you do you have a, a, a do you have a list of games that you're going to play? It. We're keeping it loose this year. We're making assignments for where everybody's going to be, but then people can kind of play within there. And we also you... kind of cracked the code finally on how to play with subs and not have it be a disaster. Because okay. in years past, you'd be like, hey, we're going to start at one o'clock, so everybody get ready. And oh, then God. we'd go too late, and then we'd cancel something, and then people would get mad, understandably so. I, and, I do. I occasionally do this thing on um, uh, with uh, Gamesbeat. They do a thing on uh, Friday, uh, PUBG. No. Uh, they, games that they play with the community. Yeah. But it's a nightmare trying to, you know, you have to give out the password to the yeah. server and then it, it's really, really hard to coordinate um, community uh, uh, co-play. Mm -hmm. But you guys have, have cracked the code? Yeah. Okay. Because we just play on PSN and we're just like, hey, we're putting it in sub-only mode. Shout out your PSN right now if you can play. But I remember like when Giant Bomb used to do like Thursday Night Throwdown, like, 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 it's always a nightmare trying to get people in. You're hurting cats. Yes, it's very Because people shout out their PSN, their name or whatever it is. They're not logged on yet, so you right. wait. They got the wrong firmware. It's a whole page. Well, the password's whole... not working or we'll whatever. We'll figure it out. We'll figure um, it out. Well, do you know what? So do you try to do you try to play games that are competitive or do you do speed runs? Like, do you, what do you little try to do? Little from column A, little from column B. It's okay. kind of, it's whatever. It's dealer's choice. Okay. We have this kind of funny world championship. We got to decide how that's get. We got to get Xavier Woods, commissioner of the kind of funny world championship on the phone. See how that's being defended. I want a platinum destiny. The Prince of Platinums, Josh Gravelick says, I can't, but I'm going to prove him wrong. I think Tim wants to get some more of the Mario moons. Yeah, you, you ever heard of the Super Mario Odyssey? I've, I have. I've heard about it. It's pretty good. Time. It's pretty, it's pretty we'll good. We'll talk about it today, I'm sure. Okay, good. Uh, you got to get those moons. Everything's just, just moons. It's Mountain all moons. And multi-moons. No, the multi-moons. The multi -moon. Come on now. There's nothing quite like no, the, the sensation the That's the one you of want. getting a multi-moon. So send me a, so figure out, let me know what you're doing and I'll figure out a yeah, time don't, to no, come no, for don't, a yeah, don't give me, I'm your boss, remember. Don't give me tasks oh, I've got to, to go, do I've for got you. I've got to go through proper channels Exactly. Now? Talk okay. to Joey if you want to talk to me. Right. For now, <laughs> let's begin the show with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. <laughs> time for some news. Five items on the Roper Report. The Baker's Dozen! Yeah, that's right, Kev. Number one, Housemark has put up a post on their website saying, Arcade is dead. Gary, I was floored when I read this. I, I just read it this morning, and I, I too, uh, my jaw was, was, was in a uh, lowered... 
position. You know how smart, <laughs> listener, viewer. We're talking about Super Stardust HD. We're talking about Dead Nation. We're talking about uh, a whole bunch of other games. Resogun, which I love. Resogun, of Rezogun course. Resogun is right, right, fantastic. Right. Uh, let's just read. I'll, I'll get to all these. We're going to read the post here from the CEO of Housemark, who I respect so much. I won't butcher his name. I think so. I think it's really interesting. I, it's 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 it's. I feel like it's newsworthy enough that it's okay to do it unabridged. Thank you. Remember. <laughs> You're my employee now. You're not. You, even if, even if it say, was too long, you go, yeah, boss. Good I job. I feel like when I, when I was doing this just as a favor, I could come in and do whatever I want. Now that this relationship has been formalized, <laughs> I feel like there's, there's a new dynamic emerging. I'm not sure how I feel about it. Housemark CEO writes letter to fans. For more than 20 years, we've been carrying the torch for arcade, bringing arcade coin op inspired games to the market with a Housemark twist. And I think it's fair to say we've gotten pretty good at it by now. Our games have received great critical reception over the years, perhaps the best example being Next Machina, which we published in June to great critical acclaim, garnering a Metacritic score of 88. Next Machina was a dream project, as we got to work with our hero and arcade gaming legend, Eugene Jarvis. I jump ahead a bit. However, despite critical success and numerous awards, our games just haven't sold in significant numbers. While some of them have reached a massive audience due to free game offerings across various digital sales channels, this unfortunately doesn't help pay for development, which gets costly for high production quality. We are extremely grateful to our fans and partners who have enabled us to work on awesome games like Super Stardust HD and Outland. For your unfailing love and support, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. But now, it's time to move on to new genres. Lackluster sales of Next Machina have led us to thinking that it is time to bring our long-standing commitment to the arcade genre to an end. While this genre will always hold a special place in our hearts, the industry is moving more towards multiplayer experiences with strong, robust communities, and it's time for Housemark to move forward with the industry. Hence, Next Machina and Matterfall will be the last of their kind coming out of our studio. Our purpose as a company remains the same, however, to create enjoyable and memorable gaming experiences for players while simultaneously creating a great workplace that allows people to flourish both professionally and personally. Looking ahead to our next projects, we are exploring something totally different than what you might expect from us, but we believe this will lead to the creation of even more engaging gaming experiences. Our core values remain the same, gameplay first with first class execution. We are really excited about our new projects and look forward to unveiling our first game from the new era of Housemark. Holy shit. What an honest, unblinking response from Housemark on this. And just a, a very much like, hey, thank you for supporting us, person who would read this, but it's just not happening. I mean, first of all, I, I, it, it is, it's rare to read a statement as, as frank mm -hmm. as that, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Usually what you get in terms of... Um, press releases and we just saw this recently with visceral you yeah. know, and the official line out of ea it was just it was pablum it was just fluff yeah it's just a bunch of word salad and you go what, what, what does that mean we're gonna say a lot but say nothing right exactly yeah. Yeah, you yeah, say yeah. you like, you've said a lot of stuff i didn't really understand you said nothing at the same time um but this is a, a, a remarkably frank and, and this is what i love about where we're at in the industry is that you have developers that are not this small like i'm insulting housemark housemark's a great studio but that no one owns them. They can yeah, say what they want to say. Yeah, they're not responsible to shareholders yeah. or whatever. They can just say whatever they want. Now, beyond that, of course, this is, I think, it's interesting on, you know, I mean, they, what's interesting about this, I mean, they chose the title. They didn't just say, we're getting out of the arcade games business. They said arcade is dead. It almost feels like this is a broader statement. They're basically saying, we're getting out of this business because this genre of games, classic, old school, coin-op inspired arcade shooters. Yeah. That's that's a dead business now, so we're getting out. That's I mean that's a much broader uh, statement, and also very certainly for gamers of a certain age like me, very quite a sad statement to make, but it's hard to argue with. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? Is that they are at the top of that pyramid. They're the king, they're the king of the castle, the right. king of the hill when it right. comes to arcade games like that. Because yeah, Resogun is awesome. Resogun dead Nation is awesome. Next Machina is awesome, but. They're being out there saying, "Hey, we're the." When you think of a great game, when you think of gameplay is king, when you think about uh, you know, what, who's who's doing these games right, we are unequivocally doing them right, and we can't make a business out of it. Okay, so why? 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 I mean, they've, they've been very upfront in saying, "Look, people just ain't. We, we're making. It's not that the games suck. Yeah, they're great. They're making. They, they are. They are the state of the art for like what an old school arcade like Resogun is basically Defender within a cylinder. Yep. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and it's brilliantly done. It's beautiful. It's great. It has all the classic Twitch based like it touches presses all the buttons that 
Defender and Stargate in those games back in the day did, but with you know fancier graphics. Sure. Why aren't ge- why why are g- video game players no longer responding to those games? Because they're saying people ain't buying the games. That's the I problem. think I think it's a niche market, and I think that much like when we talk about what a, what a, like I was talking on the the bombcast yesterday about like Bethesda and the performance of Evil Within Two and Dishonored Two. What were their goals? What were their sales goals? Was that game a success to them? I think for Housemark, they are a, a, a fairly large independent studio that makes great games. But if you're going to get more people in there, if you're going to like, you figure they had to have hired more people to work on these two projects, right? Because Matterfall and Next Machina came out within months of each other, which is rare for a Housemark game. Right. You figure they, I would assume, grew to an extent of, hey, we need to be able to produce these games, and then they produced those games, and they didn't sell that much. It's one of, the, it's always the thing of. What a success to EA is very different than what's a success to the development team of seven people. I mean, I don't disagree that, that this kind of game has become a niche genre. Certainly it has. Um, you know, it, it just really only at the indie level, which is fine. You don't need AAA budgets to make these games. Sure. That's part of the appeal. Um, but, you know, ge- there's always been a Geometry Wars or, a, mm-hmm. you know, Super Stardust or something out there uh, plugging away. Um, and I understand that it has retreated into into a niche genre, but now it seems like it's it might be... I think it, I think it will still always be around, but it seems like increasingly now what you're going to get is th- stuff like uh, Pac-Man Champion Edition DX, where the sure. brand p- people will always be looking for. Oh, Pac-Man! I know what that is, and don't get me, I love Championship Edition DX. It's fantastic, and there are all, there will always be games like that. But the original ones, the Rezo Guns, the Geometry Wars, the Super Stardust, if they're going away, that's really sad. And maybe younger uh, gamers who grew up a generation after the likes of me will feel less sad about it because they don't have that same connection. But as someone who remembers the days of pumping, uh, well, for me, it used to be like 10, 10 P pieces and 50 pence pieces sure. into um, uh, an, a, arcade you know, a, an arcade game in, in, a, in, a, in a back corner of some dusty video arcade. That was the shit. That was what got me into video games. That's what I loved. I used to love arcade games and coin ops. And obviously arcades have gone away, but that style of gameplay was surviving and now this feels like a big bellwether like if housemark are getting out one of the one of the top developers are saying we're getting out because it's just not viable anymore i I feel like this kind this this kind of game this kind of video game which is so specifically connected its roots go all the way back to the 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 genesis of video games of space invaders and pong and defender if that's going away that's really sad. But here's my question for you. Isn't this, if we talk about Housemark leaving this space, the arcade space, and then say, well, arcade games in general are dying. And I mean arcade games on a digital platform, not an arcade. Aren't we, sim- aren't we doing the same thing we're doing to single player? Where, sure, the, the people who were doing it the best are leaving it and going to go in a different direction. But isn't that in a way, and this isn't me insulting the games, them growing up, them, them taking this next step to a bigger game, a bigger project? Because my argument would be that you know, for your geometry wars, your things that these are simple games, great graphics, different things. People can put twists on them and stuff. I still think that the independent market has the ability to make those. I still think when you put together, Hey, we're this new studio and we're trying stuff out and we just want to focus on gameplay. They're going to make something like that and they're going to put that out and that'll be, have a chance for a greater success because there's less baggage. Whereas I really feel like how smart comes out of the gate does super stardust and then expectations begin. They start signing different deals. They start growing and growing and growing, but they get to this point that the smaller games they've made in the past for a dedicated audience just aren't paying the bills. I don't think there's anything. I don't, I don't feel like games like, um, you know, Resogun or geometry wars or Pac-Man DX or any of those kind of classic, you know, video game, those old coin up style titles. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they are any, I don't think of those as like, kids games because oh, yeah. they're, and that's what they're I the mean. simplicity that's not what I mean they are often the greatest barometer of your skill as a gamer it's like you know what's your high score in Defender hell or, yeah you know Pac- next Man Machina is tough if you want to get through there seriously and do it. I mean, that, I, I mean, you could argue that that is like Twitch gameplay distilled down to its purest essence and I think there will always be apparently a shrinking but there will always be a market for it yeah. I think just what's happened is though is the gaming has evolved so much around it and you're looking like Assassin's Creed Origins and mm, Battlegrounds mm. and and you know, even something like Mario Odyssey, where they took they took a classic concept and it's continued to evolve and grow and become more and more sophisticated, but while still you know re- retaining that classic feel. Games that are unapologetically kind of throwback retro style games, within the context of everything else around them, maybe maybe they do look like maybe they they look less appealing. And again, the 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 kind of people who have a natural affinity to those games of, of my age, you remember playing them back in the day, where there's some nostalgic appeal. 
maybe we're just aging out of the market and, and, and gamers that are coming up, you know, the younger, young, younger generations of gamers just don't have that same connection to those games, the historical connection. Right, the letter here says, the industry is moving towards multiplayer experiences with strong, robust communities, and it's time for Housemark to move forward with the industry. But is there, would there be a way, though, to combine those two? Could a very smart developer create a brilliant Defender um, or a Stargate or a Tempest tile game that actually could work in a multiplayer social community context. I don't know. That I would, would think so. That would be an amazing thing to try to do. Because here's my thing. I think when you read this, I'm putting Mario Odyssey into that conversation because Mario Odyssey right now is a community movement. When I talk to somebody else who plays games, they're playing Mario Odyssey and we get to talk about it. Similar to when Pac-Man uh, Pac Championship Edition originally hit and Dave Clayman was obsessed with it, all of IGN was obsessed with it. We all talked about it, right? Right. The, the games from Housemark, while great, the more and more they put out, the less and less special it gets. And I'm not insulting Housemark. I'm just saying, like, Super Stardust, everybody was all over. And Dead Nation, people, I remember having conversations with Shu and Sid on, on Twitter about Dead Nation. But next Machina did feel like I was playing in a vault by myself. I well, played but as Super, other but scales. Super Mario is in the air supply right now because it's so great. And, in, and everyone, it's like, you know, two million copies in, in a week or whatever. And mm -hmm. everyone's playing it. And it's, it's the game of the moment for sure. And well deserved. It's a fantastic game. But that's still unapologetically a closed off single place. It's not like someone else can jump into your into New Donk City with you and start playing with you. Right. What I'm saying is, it is, and I'm just completely making this up as I go, would it be possible to resurrect the classic coin-op uh, shooter arcade genre by finding some way to make it social? 100%. And can, maybe I, I drop into your game of, you know, whatever it is, you know, Resogun or Geometry World Superstar, whatever it may be. Is there a way to kind of bring that multiplayer, that social appeal, and resurrect a classic genre that way. I have no idea how you would even be... I just, I'm just asking the question. I totally think so. I, and I go back to last year when uh, I fell in love with a game called Sparkade. you ever play this on your mobile Sparkade? device? Sparkade? Sparkade. Okay. Yeah, Greg Canessa, former, the guy who started Xbox Live, okay. got over on this thing and started this game up. Uh, of course... Uh, disclosure after we talked about it and interviewed Greg Canessa and I started playing it, we did do a sponsorship with them at the end of the year. So take over the grain of salt if you want. But the idea was that it, I love Tetris. Sparkade took Tetris and a couple other classic games, put them into this mobile app, and then had it where you could go challenge other players. And you could, if you, you could earn tokens in the thing to then bet on token only thing, or you could put real money in and play for real money and, and bet other people. But what was interesting about it is it took everything I love about trophies or Xbox Live and put it into one thing where I was leveling up, which unlocked me new avatars, which unlocked me better daily bonuses. Then when I'm playing people, I could add them to my friends list. So I would have challenges going back and forth with my friends. So suddenly Tetris, which had always been a very solitary experience. I'm just playing it on the Game Boy. I'm playing it wherever. It suddenly became, oh, I'm now playing games of Tetris with a dozen kind of funny best friends out there. Not for real money, some for real money, whatever. But I'm playing into that thing and doing it where I feel like all of a sudden there was a Sparkade community doing it. In, in I'm place. just wondering what the real, in trying to diagnose this, yeah. I'm wondering what the real issue is. Is it that people only want games that have some kind of social multiplayer connection? Super Mario Odyssey would seem to suggest no, because that, again, is a single player experience. Uh, there's no social or multiplayer aspects. And yet it's so well done. Everyone, of course, is, is loving it and it's fantastic and doing very well. Um, so is it then, is the problem simply that even if you added multiplayer and social aspects to, um, you know, a classic arcade style shooter, you know, done in a modern style yeah. that people would still look at it and say, that feels old fashioned to me. Like it's still like 2d Twitch shooting. I understand that it has historical roots, but like I just gaming tastes again, as, as more generations of gamers are growing up that grew up after that, that coin up that arcade genre that don't have that sentimental connection to it. It just, it's just, it's just, it doesn't appeal to them the same way. I mean, it may well be as sad as it is that, that like, like a style of music that's never really going to come back, mm. that this is just, that this kind of gaming is just now out of fashion and will, and will forever be the province of like crusty old gamers like, like you and me. Well, I think it'll always come back into fashion though. I think there'll always be a breakout. Yeah. Like the eighties will come back again and again. Exactly. Right? I think we, what I think this letter to me says is that for our arcade for house mark is dead because there's a ceiling to that. Those kind of games right now, based on their extensive experience, only sell so many and only get so far. And Housemark wants to be a developer that's around another I 10, 20 the, years. I, think, I would say the good news about it, though, is that because this style of game is so... I don't want to. I don't mean this as a pejorative, but uh, it's it's primitive, right? You don't yeah. need fancy graphics. Yeah. You, you it's a very like Defender and Pac-Man and Space Invaders are very simple ideas 
uh, simply executed, but there's something inherently compelling and uh, about them. You know, you want you want to keep playing, you want to keep pumping the quarters in. That's why those games are classics. The good news about that is because the the um, the barrier to development potentially is so low, there will always be indie developers that can afford to keep plugging away and exactly. trying those things. Exactly. Like there's a game on Steam right now called 20XX. I don't know if you've played it, but it's essentially Mega Man yeah. on PC. Yeah. And it's fantastic. It's a brilliant game. If you love Mega Man, it's it's an incredible game. I, I, th- I remember kind of amazed they got away with it, frankly, because it is really cheeky. Like the degree yeah. to, which it, to which it is Mega Man is astonishing. But it's a little developer. And I can't imagine it costs them a lot of money to make it. So you can still, you know, if that's your nostalgia, you have to remember, like, people making games are still the ones that grew up with that original genre, where we're going to be two, three generations from now. Who knows? But for right now, there are people that still want to harken back. And I would argue that considering it is the original genre, that it is, you know, those kind of games are where gaming began, that there will always be some fondness for them but i think it's going to become less and less you'll always be able to find these games but the 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 the, the day of them being a, a genre that you would put like you know you've got your it's like no one makes flight sims anymore right yeah. no one makes um real-time strategy games really anymore well, we're uh, talking about this right at the playstation uh conference oh they're putting out a tennis game oh right what happened to the tennis game genre oh they're putting out uh you know arcadey racer games like oh yeah Remember when there was a million of those? There was you, everywhere you looked. There was a tennis game. Everywhere you looked, it was motor. At any at any given time, there are there's, there's a subset of game genres that are in vogue. Right. Yeah. So like right now, obviously, first person shooters are, continue to be popular. Uh, open world, Assassin's Creed, explore, you know, exploring type sandbox type games. Yeah. Great GTA. They're very you know everyone's kind of chasing that because that's where the big things are. Um, and like you said, fashions change, and you know, flares, flared trousers will be back again soon, oh, I'm God, sure. No. And the '90s are back right now, and the '80s will be back again in 20 more years. This it's weird to think, but this age that we're living in, 30, 40 years from now, will have a comeback. Oh yeah, right. It all, it, 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 everything goes around in this great circle of life. But ju- again, as bottom line, as someone who grew up on this old style of game, as inevitable as it is, as you know, kind of just the seismic geological evolution of of this art form continues. That things are going to continue to are going to increasingly disappear into the past. They'll always have historical significance, but less and less will they be the kind of games that we play today. And it's it's inevitable, and maybe it's just a, it's a reality. But it personally saddens me. It personally saddens Eric, who wrote into kindoffunny.com slash kfgd and says, "Hey, Greg and Gary, I went to look at the gaming news for the day, and I saw a strange headline: Arcade is dead." I didn't think much of it until my eyes wandered to the source. That is when my heart sank. House Mark Games, holy shit. I'm sure many of us know the feeling of watching a niche genre, series, or game struggle despite their quality and the passion that goes into them, but this one is extra hard to see. Greg talks about how in Game of the Year discussions, people at places like IGN will campaign for their game, and one they know doesn't deserve the mainstream appeal to win in the votes, but feels deserving of the title nonetheless. For me, that would have been Next Machina. Next Machina is perfect, actually perfect, but it is a perfect arcade game. And I guess that is just not good enough. I don't think that arcade games are dead. I think that if a genre can make good games, it will last forever. For now, though, a moment of silence as a great arcade games take a pause for however long that may be. Good luck to Housemark on whatever they do next. Long live the kings of gameplay. P.S. Everyone should still go out and buy Next Machina, and I believe it is getting a physical release soon. Also, Matterfall, while not perfect, is still a solid housemark game and currently on sale on the PlayStation Store. I'm going to pick up Next Machina. I see, I'm part of the problem. I like you these games. You son of a I didn't, I didn't bitch. You didn't even Machina. pick it up? I should get it. You should. It's real good. It's awesome. Like, that's the thing is, like, you play it, and it's great, and you run through it, but I, it's the same thing I have always, with the exception of... Dead Nation, which really pulled me in. Alienation, I liked a lot and would have gotten into deeper if there wasn't the bug like there always is in a Housemark game for people with a million trophy, or friends. Uh, it's the thing of you play them over and over and over again. And I feel like that's what's not in vogue anymore is playing games over and over again to try to get a better score to try to get because you figure I'm playing play say earlier like over so, and over again so you're much of what we consider like the, the just the just the vernacular of games like high like when's the last time you talked about your high score in a video game right that's that's old man talk yeah leaderboards aren't even right really or like clock, what, what, what we used to what we used to call clocking a game where you where the where you get to like nine 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 yep. nine and the and the and the score resets mm-hmm. um high scores are gone like you don't think about high score anymore like you your, your achievements in games are or um, have evolved so much. I mean, there's so many more sophisticated ways to to measure achievement 
um, in a game. Yeah. But the idea of like a high score, that's something that exists in like, you know, uh, classic game tournaments and things that they still have, like Donkey Kong tournaments and sure. stuff. But it's no longer part of how, it's just no, part, no longer part of how games are designed. And that's back to what they're talking about, I really feel, with the multiplayer community stuff. Not even like, oh, it's got it, they're going to make fucking Destiny. The way that it is just like, how do you excite a community? How do you make people interested in like what is the high score? What is the new high score for video games? And it is in Destiny, it's loot, it's this armor, in you know, it's a chicken dinner in PUBG. It's all these different things that you get proud of, but you're not proud of the fact that hey, I mean, even I don't even hear and granted, I don't play much multiplayer stuff as everybody knows in terms of shooters. You don't hear about kill death ratio that much anymore, is where for a while that was the big stat. Oh, I think you do battle, battlegrounds, it's still a big metric. Okay. Um but I I, I know what you mean. Uh, there, there's again the the metrics have become so much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? I miss putting my initials into high score tables. Do you? Do you still remember? Like, what were your oh, GJM? I, did, I stuck your with three I stuck initials. With the real or what? Thing. GGM. GJM. GJM. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What's the What's the J? James. Greg okay. James Miller. Gregory yeah. James Miller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I used to do GLW. That was always me. What What's the L for? L. Leslie. Yeah. That's oh, my middle name. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're learning a lot about you now. I know. Well, now that now that I'm on the team, I feel yeah, like we have I, to be paperwork. It's time to start opening up. Number two. EA is not rushing to the switch. This is according to the Wall Street Journal, whose tech reporter put out this Dow Jones Newswire screen cap. EA in no rush to make more video games for Nintendo Switch. Market talk. Electronic Arts is waiting until Nintendo's new Switch has been on the market a full year before deciding whether to release more games for it besides FIFA 18, the company's finance chief, Blake Jorgensen, tells the Wall Street Journal. The Switch, both a home console and portable gaming device, launched in March, and EA's soccer game was released on it late September in late September. Jorgensen says it's too soon for EA to judge the success of FIFA 18 on the device and wants to fully understand what the demand is for Switch before committing more resources to it. Just to toss out there, because we're always worrying, talking about what a third party is going to do for the Switch. Where is that going? Yeah. I think with the success it's seeing, they'll have to figure it out if they want to be on They'll there. have to figure it out, but again, at the end, I also don't care that much. Yeah. Again, if... You want Nintendo. I, I, I think that the Switch at this point... It's funny, you look up, go back in the Wii and the Wii U, the conversation was, uh, for a big part of it, well, can the, can, a, can such a system survive without major support from the likes of EA and Activision? Yeah. And the answer at the time seemed to be no. Yeah. Now that Nintendo has really got its house in order so much more, where they get so many, like, more great AAA releases in the first year than you typically see over the whole life of an old style, like a GameCube or whatever. Yeah. And again, such, we've talked about this a million times, such great indie support. I don't think they need them. Yeah. I don't think they need EA. I don't think they need Activision. And again, if you if you want to play uh, Battlefront Two or Destiny or whatever, chances are again I, we talked about maybe Switch is the first con Nintendo console that's viable as like the one and only console that you own. Yeah. But I'm guessing most people have an Xbox or a PlayStation as or well. Or a PC. Just go or a PC. Just go over there. You're, you're going to play the EA and the Activision, the big AAA high system spec games with big multiplayer communities. And again, Switch. That's one thing Switch can't offer you is like multiplayer community. Um, just go over there. The Switch, it, the Switch will be over here doing its own if thing. If Switch it's continues its great. momentum, though, where people are like, every time a game gets announced, they're like, is it running on Switch? You know what I mean? Is it happening there? I think EA is going to see dollar signs in that. I think Activision will see dollar signs yeah, in they're that. Yeah, they're going to go where the money is. There's, there's obviously still, you know, looking at the viability of it. It's probably still more expensive to make. When they say making a game for the Switch, I, I, would, I would much rather, here's what I'd much rather do. Yeah. If I was head of EA, or certainly as a consumer looking at them, I would rather EA, rather than them saying, well, yeah, here's FIFA on the Switch, here's, you know, um, Battlefield, you know, one on the Switch or whatever, create a Switch games division and, yep. and make games that are tailored for the Switch that work great for the Joy-Cons, rather than trying to say, oh, shit, how do we make Madden work with the Joy-Cons this year? And that's how we have all those bad versions of those games. Do build for the system. Don't just port over stuff and try and shoe on it into a system that is technically inferior because it is. Yep. Uh, is is multiplayer inferior? Is is very wacky in its control scheme. Nintendo does well and indie developers do well on the Switch because they build games for the Switch and play to its strengths. Do that. Create a Switch division inside of EA and say make great games for the Switch. And the, clearly at this point, you said we're seeing indie developers saying we're seeing better sales on Switch than any other platform. Maybe the time is right to do that. But I don't care about Battlefield or, no. or, or you know the, the big EA games on the Switch. I'll play those somewhere else on, on systems that are better tailored 
for those games. You're preaching you're preaching the word there. I think that's what the success will be. And what I honestly think will happen is that as the Switch marketplace becomes flooded, there are so many games out there and indies start to see less success, not none, none or anything, but it becomes like PSN or Xbox Live where there's just way too much stuff where a developer like Housemark is being overshadowed just by the sheer number of games. I feel like that's when EA or Activision can be like, hey, Let's partner with this game. You guys are come pitch us your cool game that is indie, but we want to put on Switch. Yeah, Nintendo want to help you. It's in their interest to have EA on the platform, but yeah. in the right way. Because it's it's not helpful to anyone. It's not helpful to EA or to Nintendo to see storylines like, oh, yeah, here's uh, Battlefront 2 on the Switch, but it kind of sucks compared to the other versions. Yeah. Nobody wants that. Like, build games for the Switch. Make the best games you can. Uh, again, encourage more You know, mid-range uh, indie development, lower risk but potentially big rewards because the Switch is clearly, you know, exploding as a platform. I think there's a big opportunity for EA. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'd like to think there are people smart enough inside EA that they're already giving this a hard look. Yeah. They're just not ready ready to announce anything right now. Of course. It was easy to ignore the other previous Nintendo systems because they just weren't, there's no viability there. The Switch yeah. is a different story right now. It's completely changed the game in terms of the way that developers and the public are looking at Nintendo. But you just gotta, You just got to build games for it instead of trying to, jamming things that don't really belong on that platform. Correct, Gary Witta. You're a smart man. I got it right. That's why I, we hired I, I, you. I'm, I'm going to say that I got this one right. Okay, good. My opinion is correct. Yeah, well, I didn't, don't write into kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong with opinion corrections. Try to write my facts. Opinions. Here comes a bullshit story. Number three, Gary Witta <laughs> is returning to The Walking Dead. What is this? How did this get in the, uh, in the running order? Apparently, so what they did is they announced that they're doing a Telltale Walking Dead collection. It's coming out December 5th on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. It is every episode of The Walking Dead, the Telltale series, uh, before the new thing, because they're doing one final season. I don't know if you've heard about it. I, I, I'm, re- I'm just reading about it now. They're doing buried, a final season of The Walking buried Dead. Buried in their press release about this uh, Walking Dead collection, they say, in addition to the announcement of this upcoming collection, coming out December 5th, pay- PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Telltale also confirmed that Gary Whitta, Rogue One, a Star Wars story, The Book of Eli, will be returning to Telltale's writer room, writer's room as a story consultant for the series' upcoming fourth and final season. Whitta was part of the BAFTA award-winning team of writers on the first season of the Telltale series and will be collaborating with Telltale and the creative team at Skybound Entertainment on the final chapters of Clementine's story. Quote, collaborating with Telltale on the first season of Clementine's journey. Do you, do you journey. really need to do that voice? I, that's, how I, that's how I read this quote from um, Gary Witta. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> collaborating with Telltale on the first season of Clementine's journey through the world of The Walking Dead was one of the highlights of my career. So reuniting with them to bring her now, Sir Story, to a close you, with the Greg, final season feels... What? Well, I, I if nailed If you're gonna it. do it, if you're gonna read my words... Oi, Governor, collaborating with the Telltale on the first Clementine... Highlights of my career. So reuniting with them to now bring her story to close with a final season feels like a homecoming, said Witta. Clementine has become not just one of the most compelling characters in the Walking Dead pantheon. Oh, I can tell you actually wrote this. But <laughs> one of the great video game characters of all time. I hope we're able to do justice to her and to her millions of fans. This one, this one feels special. Who writes this stuff? You did, apparently. Full of just hot air. Joe Stoffer Stoff- Stoff- came over and said, like, just about, give me a quote. Talking about PR Pablum yeah, earlier, yeah. like words, meaningless word salad. I guess I'm I'm as guilty of it as the next man. Well, th- this is the problem, right? They come to you, hey, give us a quote about this thing you're writing. You're they, asked for, they asked me for a quote and I, and I bashed one out. Uh, they asked me for a headshot. I said, I don't have any good ones. Good luck with Google image search. You're just going to be that one in the Star Wars helmet again? I've got, I'm every, I, I got, you know, I have to get, I have to find someone that can do a decent, I mean, I don't think it's, it's, it's possible, but like a <laughs> decent headshot of me. Because we got a guy. People ask, I, like literally whenever I'm in the news on whatever it is, like people go on Google search and they put like literally like a holiday snap or whatever. Yeah. That's, there's no actual picture of me that's well a, now that you're decent. part of team kind of funny we do have photo shoots all the time for new oh well maybe i could maybe i could get we'll a get decent, sean finnegan get the a shark shot. we'll take one for you and okay. then we can add it to the reddit too because the subreddit's got all our faces up there oh, we're gonna put your face up there that's great there's a lot of work a lot of things got to change now that you're here you know yeah yeah i feel like this i'm, I'm gonna be professional is it, is it gonna be like a shopping montage where you take me like to all the <laughs> finest woman. places yeah yeah walking well, gary and, like, remake me you're like, getting new t-shirts or eliza, all kind of funny eliza do little me into someone more <laughs> more respectable so this is yeah this is this is cool this is great congratulations thank you it's so weird because i honestly there's a complete coincidence that I knew that they were going to announce this, but I didn't know the day. The day that you and I knew I was story. coming back in here, but I didn't know the day, and it yeah. ended up being the same day. That's awesome. Um, are you, there's a lot of pressure. Are you excited? You got to end Clementine's story. You got to land this plane. It's really interesting. Uh, there's only so much I can say about. Uh, of course, it. of course. It's it's really interesting that I was talking to someone about this the other day. That you know there are these there are many different iterations of The Walking Dead, but the ones that I consider like the three 
kind of main cornerstone pillars of it are, of course, the comic, yeah. the AMC TV show, yeah. and I think legitimately the Telltale games. I 100%. think they've earned that the right to be to be spoken of in the same breath uh, with the with the um, with the TV show and the comic books. This will be the first iteration of The Walking Dead to come to a definitive end. This story, Clementine's sure. story, is going to end. And so we had to, I've, been, I've, you know, I've already been in the writer's room and sat around with the, a lot of the talented uh, Telltale writers to figure out like what, it, what is going to be Clementine's journey and what's going to be her story as we now bring, because it won't be any more, this is the last time Telltale is going to do one of these games. So yeah. you can't just leave it, blah, like you have to, there has to be, a, you know, a, a, an end. The story has to end in a way that is satisfying for all the players out there who love Clementine and love this particular world. No. Uh, so it's a big, it's, it's, yeah, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. You know, I'm one of those people. I know. So if you, you screw you, it up, you're right here. You love it. Yeah, exactly. You, and and you I, I agree. And with I you. love, and I love Clem. And I remember when I um, did my episode of the walking dead, I literally, I got, I mean like playful, but like playful threats, like you better not hurt Clementine yeah, yeah. because people came to really love her. Yeah. And uh, she is, I think she really is one of the great characters and it's a lot of, um, you know, we do set definitely like collectively all the people in that room that are responsible for figuring out how to bring Clementine's story to a to a to a definitive conclusion. That's it's it's, it's tough. Yeah, it's well, tough. I, I agree with you as a Walking Dead fan since you know graphic novel number two, right? And back in two thousand and five mm. when I found The Walking Dead, uh, I agree that like I think the Telltale games are one of if not the best iteration of The Walking Dead. And the, granted. You're stacking the deck. I'm making the choices. I'm building these relationships. I'm getting really invested. Yeah, you feel in this invested world. because exactly. you're making those choices. Yeah, but yeah, you know, it's outside of what Walking Dead 100 issue 100. I like. I mean, I teared up reading that, but like, I cried playing The Walking Dead. Right? Does but, it? Does it? Does it kill you that I know how Clementine's story ends, but I won't tell you? No. You're okay with not knowing? Yeah, no, I don't want to ruin it for him. You're not like a spoiler. You know, yeah, because you say you're not the kind of person that has to know the spoilers, right? No, not at all. And that's the thing where it's like, you know, Telltale always be like, hey, you know, oh, we got the PC version of the game done. We can bring it by. I'm like, I'll wait for PlayStation 4. I was I, hoping it was something I, I'd be able to torture you with, but it's not. No, I can't hold I won't it give you, you I won't give you that. I won't give you that kind of thing. I'll give you a lot of suggestions you the satisfaction. If you want. Episode one, just get rid of AJ. This, this baby, we don't need him. The, the, yeah, the little baby. Yeah. yeah just get him. Because that was the problem with the season two. They didn't give me the option just to leave this baby behind. That's what that, I that's, done. that's an option you were looking I, for. I, I, yeah. Abandon, like, abandon a baby. I'm a kid. There's a baby. There's zombies. I ain't got time for this. How do you Even usually like to play? Do you like to try and are you more of a paragon or a renegade when you play through these kind of games? I, I for them, I re, I really read the situation. And I think that speaks to the power of what the game is in the fact that it's not. I'm but only do you generally try to do the right thing? Like as Lee, I did as okay. Lee. I think I think the the walk, the Telltale Walking Dead games have done a great job of showing you how really you would transition into a gray area slash everybody's the villain here. Because with Lee at the outbreak, with Clem, like, you know, you guys played with our emotions. You gave us a kid to protect that we all fell in love with. So yeah. it was very much like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But like when you get to your episode, uh, episode four of Walking Dead, right? And that guy's like, listen, man, you know she should come with us. We're better. That was definitely one of the first, not one of the first times, one of the most memorable times I grabbed him. Like, I'm like, we're going hard on this guy. Like, get the fuck away from us. You don't right. talk to me like that. You don't talk to her like that. It's really interesting. I don't think even the guys at Telltale uh, fully realized just how um, powerful that connection to Clementine was going to be. Like I said, yeah. I got these kind of mock death threats over it. Like, don't, like, don't hurt her. Yeah. Because um, you really wanted to protect her. And uh, I remember, it's funny, a lot of the ways that, it, it's so instructive. I learned so much working with Telltale just on that first season. Um, that often, the, and, it's, and what's really interesting, we do episodically, you're getting feedback from like episode one while you're working on like episode three and four or whatever. So you're seeing how people are reacting to the characters. Um, and I remember a lot of people, remember Ben from season one? Oh yeah, I hated um, Ben. <laughs> everyone hated Ben. Yeah. Because he was the guy, like Ooh. every every zombie group has that guy that's well-intentioned, but sooner or later he's gonna get every, he's gonna get you all fucking killed. Yeah. Because he's incompetent or, you know, whatever. He's just not, he's not a survivor. And uh, we tried to build the character in that way, and we were getting all this feedback. Can you please give us the opportunity to fucking kill Ben? I hate Ben. I hate Ben. And we, oh my god, this son of a bitch, Ben! I want to kill him. We're like, okay. So when we got to my episode, where there's a there's a moment where you can you can let you know, kill him, but you can let him the die. Bell like tower, he's hanging right? from a bell yeah. tower, and you can choose to either pull him up or let him go. And we tried to stack that choice in a way that would encourage people like it was okay to let him go like he was literally he had, at that point in the story he had recognized that he was a danger to the group yeah. and he was literally saying to Lee like 
just let me go. You know it's the right thing to do. Like I, I want you to let me go. And we had playtesters come in and play it, and every single person saved him. And we were like, you've been begging for this choice. You've been begging for this opportunity to kill him. We gave it to you, and none of you took it. And they were like, when, when the moment came, I just couldn't do it. Like I had to save him. Yeah. And so we had to go back. And when that happens, that's a broken choice because you want people to have a hard time making the choice. Know. It can't be too easy one way or the other. So we actually had to go back and find ways to stack the deck against Ben more so that people would be more inclined. inclined. And I think in the end, it ended up like two thirds to a third, which is still not as close to 50-50 as I would have liked, but like we pulled it back. Yeah. You know how we did it? Huh. We had him in danger Clementine. Mm. We were like, See, that let's was do a moment was, where Clementine's in trouble danger. and he abandons her. Yeah. And in that moment- That's people, the first, uh, that, that's when you're in the, the streets, first, right? And yeah, like they that, all come that and climb was, and he runs was, the other so way. So that was kind of like a reshoot. We had to reshoot that scene gotcha. because the play test demonstrated the choice was broken. That not, not again, even though people are going to drop Ben because they hate him, they hate him. People are telling us, but it's, it's a big difference between what you say and what you'll actually do given the choice. Yeah. When you, when you say, okay, put up or shut up time. You want to kill him? You've been asking to kill him all season. Here you go. And nobody killed him. So we had to go back and we're like very careful about whenever we do a Clementine because we know that players respond to her yeah. so powerfully. It's like she's like the kryptonite to play it. So like we don't want to use her all the time, but we need It's like, what can we do? It's like, I think I think he needs to put Clem in danger because we knew that people would have such a visceral reaction to that. And it worked. People started dropping him. Yeah. See, and that's what's fascinating because that whole thing, that was one of my choices. Why I was like, I'm, I was already against you. I'm, you have to... Similar to what you're saying in the writer's room, right? As a player, I had to have a one-sentence description of what my objective was. Right. And my objective was always protect Clem, get Clem from point yeah, A to That's always point. number one. Clem is my thing. So, like, yeah, Ben, I obviously, I already knew he was a threat to the group. I was like, well, you're out of this. You jump ahead to season two where you were playing as Clem. That's when I started being a little more, like, I'm going to be cool for the most part. I'm going to be guarded with these people that I don't know. Rebecca's being a bitch to me. I'm going to be a bitch back to her and threaten her with information that I know about like the, you know, the uh, father of her kid or stuff. But then like getting in and I'm spoiling season two right now. You should have played by now. When we get in there and like Michael Madsen's character is getting about to get beat down or whatever. Carver, I believe his name was. And it was like, I wanted to stay. I made Clem stay to watch that. Cause like Clem's we're transitioning. We're sliding into the darkness here. And like, she knows the world there and people are trying to pull her away and they're saying stuff like, but you're just a kid or whatever. And it's like, no, we're not a kid. I'm not a kid in this world anymore. That's not where we are in the walking dead. And when you get to the end of season two, and this is the AJ joke I made, right? We get there and it's Kenny and what was Christine's like? Do you remember Christine Lakin's character's name? Uh, I want to say Christine, but that's not right. It's Kenny and Christine Lakin's character and they've, they're battling around. And I remember playing this in, you know, obviously I know the telltale people super well. I'm playing this in a theater uh, with my choices already laid out. And they're wrestling around, and everybody knows that I'm I'm Mr. Kenny. I love Kenny. I was so excited to have Kenny I was, back. I was in I had a soft spot for Kenny myself. And it, and it helps that you know, like Gavin, who's been on the uh, Gavin Hammond, who's been on the Game Over Greggy show and stuff, voices Kenny. So there's like that connection too. Just in the same way, you know, we know Melissa so well, and she's Clem. But I'm sitting there, they battle, and I let Kenny kill Christine Lakin's character, and I have the gun drawn. And I do, don't do anything, and I'll never forget this. Then Kenny came back up. And like it gave me the option to draw the gun on him or whatever, shoot him. And I and I drew the gun. And there, uh, Laura from Telltale in the back gasped, because everyone thought they knew me and how I would end this game. But I got to this point, and it was the point for me where it was like totally broken for Clem of just like my I'm Clem and I gotta survive. And he's crazy now. And you pull that gun on him, and he's just like just do it and like it's another one of those things of like he knows he's gone he knows he's not the kenny we all fell in love with and to sh shoot him right in the head and have him drop over it it was great but then we got to the moment of like she doubles back to get aj and i felt for me that was a break of just like i i guess that i went ice cold on it right like i my clem went ice cold and killed one of the connections to lee which is one of the connections right. to regular life and right. these relationships she had so for me i would have been like See the baby in the car and just shut. It will kill the baby probably, but shut the car door and leave. That is one of the appeal of those games. Is even though they're single player games, they're strangely social. If you play them with other people, oh, yeah. you on the couch, everyone's invested. Everyone's kind of pitching in, like, no, don't make this choice, make the other choice, because everyone's got an opinion. Yep. But only one person gets to drive, and well, uh, it's really. I was enjoy playing those games with, with my wife when you know you, you like if you've got sometimes you don't get enough time, but like if you've got. 
what should, what should I do? What should I do? And it's fun to kind of get uh, uh, other people playing along with you. It, and it, they work socially as well. If you when you let when you play them live, everyone's like, oh, you know, in the Twitch stream, yeah, everyone's yeah, yeah. like, going, oh, don't do this. Well, I mean, some of the most cherished IGN memories harken back to what we're talking about with Housemark, right? And what I think a multiplayer experience, a robust community, means nowadays is the fact that I'd come home or come back to IGN after playing it or whatever, and Mitch Dyer would have played it that night too. And the first right. thing we would do is pour coffees and go into a meeting room and shut Compare the door. Notes. What did you do? How did you, yeah. why would you do that? What happens? And like figure out. And that's the whole thing where people are like, I hate it when people talk about these games and they're like, it's the illusion of choice. There's no real choices, blah, blah, blah. But like there would be these intense discussions of how this happened and why that happened. Like, like I always talk about, you start at the same point, you go wide and then you have to come back to the same ending. And that, that's what was great is great about those kind of games. Yeah, I'm really I'm really glad that they're the that we're we're doing this um this final um season and uh we like I said gonna try to do, do justice to a character that people over the years have really grown um to to love. Have a lot of yeah. affection for. I'm glad they're doing this um I don't know if you mentioned on this collection here. Um, they've remastered everything, which is really nice. Oh, so you I get every, so you get everything, all the DLC all in one box, but they've re they've remastered all the graphics so they just look a little fresher than okay. they did first time around. Cool. Yeah. Number four on the longest rope report of all time. <laughs> Some sales numbers to chew on. This is from IGN. Uh, financial results for the second quarter of fiscal year 2017 reveal that Sony Interactive Entertainment set 4.2 million units to retailers this quarter, bringing up the lifetime total of the PlayStation 4 to 67.5 million units shipped. Remember, this isn't sold, just shipped to, to retailers. These numbers result in the company raising the predictions for PlayStation 4 to meet 79 million units shipped by March 2018. But what is the current um, state? I know PlayStation's, PlayStation's ahead, but do you know off the top of your head what the rough numbers are in terms of like installed... Like how many like in homes? How many PlayStation yeah, yeah. 4s and how many Xbox Ones there are? Well, we well that's that's the thing. I think in kindoffunny dot com slash you're wrong. This is definitely one that this is a perfect. Of, I'm, I'm you got you up me. Perfectly. You got me. I want to say what PlayStation. The last time we reported was sixty five, and I want to say that was sold through. I don't think that was just shipped. PS four. Yeah, in homes. I think so. Right. I think so. And is that what? Is that that's worldwide? That's worldwide. Okay. And then Xbox never talks about their numbers. They don't so, talk about their numbers, no. which means they're way behind. Oh yeah. And okay. so I think like uh, there's been some creative science and sleuthing that I think pegged them around 40 million a while back maybe but that I was know a while it's, ago. I know it's a nice thing in the in the in the universe of bragging rights to say you know we have we've sold this many more than the other guy yeah but at the end of the day it doesn't matter that much if all Xbox the Microsoft cares about like are we making a ton of money sure. just you know in our own right and the guys across the street might be making more and we'll, we'll always try to catch up but all they as long as they're profitable in their own right that's that's enough I guess the re and people always talk about the console wars, right? And I hate that because it makes us get into sides and argue about stupid stuff. And granted, it's so, it's so boring. I make fun of PC a lot, but I'm you know I'm joking about it. Play wherever you want to play. What I like about the console race is the fact that PlayStation being so far ahead makes Xbox try harder. And whether and they've made so many great gamer first decisions in, in the time since they announced the yeah, Xbox the competition one. is great and because so, the only way you can get ahead is by offering people a better a better a better deal. And so let's say that that starts turning the corner. Xbox One X does this great thing. We're about to talk about PUBG. That brings more people in. Then suddenly PlayStation has to look at what Xbox has done with backwards compatibility, what Xbox has done with the Xbox game game program. What, what they, I think that's what they call it or whatever. The, you know, the one where you yeah, like yeah, Netflix yeah. for games. Uh, they've done so many great things there that I, I'd love to see that shine out more. You know, playing nice with them on terms of uh, cross-platform play. It's a really interesting spot to be in right now yeah the whole console wars thing is so boring yeah. to me i mean but people still do it every day right you're either an xbox or a sony i don't yeah. know what the what the pejorative there is pony they call them ponies a pony yeah i've been called the pony a lot yeah you're a pony no i'm not but i've been called that a lot yeah i just prefer <laughs> to play things on playstation i covered it for eight years right it was my sole beat on the job so yeah i know it pretty well uh and then more numbers for you the persona series has reached a new sales milestone according to sega's 2017 annual report the franchise is now topped 8.5 million units sold packaged in digital total across 13 total editions i've never played a persona game really so many people i know are like if you're into like there's no casual persona fans if you're into no. persona you're into you gotta persona. love persona yeah but yeah, i yeah. would i like persona do you like turn-based rpgs do you like high school drama i like i I like high school. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, then you'd like it. Yeah. For sure. All right. Play the new one. What's P a good Persona end? Can you, can you just dive in? Can yeah, I, just I would get say, the new I mean, one? if you want to play on your Vita, play Persona 4 Golden and have it with you at all times. If you want to play on the PS4, well, you don't have any choices. Persona 5? Persona was, 5. Okay. Which is awesome. It's okay to come in. Yeah. They, well, they're like, uh, they're like Final Fantasies, you know, where oh, you just jump different? in. Yeah, okay. yeah. You might get a reference here or there, understand something a bit more, but it's you don't need to. All right. I'll give it a try. Okay. 
And then finally, number five. PUBG game of the year question mark. This is an IGN story that I found interesting. Speaking to Player Unknown's Battlegrounds creative director Brendan Player Unknown Green, that's a mouthful. I asked what he thought of early access games like PUBG being considered for game of the year awards, and he somewhat surprisingly told me, "Quote personally, I don't want to win game. Of, uh, I don't want to win a game of the year award." While I would love to win it for the team, I think this year there have been far better games. Uh, Green specifically called out The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Horizon Zero Dawn as, quote, masterpieces of game design and storytelling. They're just wonderful, wonderful games. I think they will probably win it. I would hope they would win it, Green said of the award. W I'm, uh, Green said the award would be a nice feather in their cap for the PUBG Corp team, but reiterated, I don't know if we deserve it. PUBG Corp CEO C.H. Kim said, quote, we're really not interested in whether they deserve awards or not and are instead focused on bringing the best gameplay to the Xbox game preview and PC version. Kim followed up by saying early access shouldn't matter when judging games for awards and that you should just look at the game itself, not the label it has. Kim explained that w once the 1.0 version comes out, we're going to continually upgrade the game going forward. We're not going to stop there. They're answering the question we've been debating on this show forever. They've been listening. Is it, should it be considered for game of the year? And then do you think it has a shot? I, you know, I, I, I like Brendan a lot. And um, I think he's obviously being very gracious here. But I don't think he's saying this just for, you know, just to appear gracious. I think I think this is honestly his opinion. I think he's yeah. right. I think there are, PUBG, I love PUBG. I think it's absolutely one of the great um, games of this year. I think it's going to be in every game of the year conversation. Yep. I think it will win a ton of awards, either, you know, format specific, you know, PC game of the year, probably is PC game of the year is my guess, uh, a genre specific in terms of overall game of the year. I think he's right. As much as I love PUBG, Breath of the Wild, um, I can't speak to Horizon Zero Dawn because I haven't played it yet. What? I will. I haven't played it yet. I'm waiting for PS4. I'm waiting, I, I, when, my, when my 4K TV shows up, okay. I'm going fair. all in. Fair, 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 fair. All in on the, with the enhanced version. But I think that Breath of the Wild and uh, Mario, I'm going to assume that Brendan hasn't played Mario Odyssey yet, otherwise you'd be talking about that of course. as well. I think those, I think between those Two. Do you think Horizon Zero Dawn is legitimately up there with Zelda and Mario as like top tier contender for Game of the Year? I think, and this is a conversation we've had on all the kind of funny products. Yeah. Up until products, is that what you call them? Yeah. Well, I call it content shows. Content you shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. IP. Uh, it's it's been a it's been a race between is it going to be Zelda? Or is it going to be Horizon? So I mean, again, I haven't played Horizon. I know a lot of people love it. Yeah. I know Breath of the Wild. It is an absolute masterpiece. Is Horizon Horizon genuinely on that level? I think so. I think that I've been the one saying I would vote for Horizon for Game of the Year. However, today I will officially confirm I'm pretty sure I'm switching my vote to Mario. You think Mario's, Mario is going gonna, is gonna to beat out Zelda and everything else? Well, I mean, this is for what I would vote for in kind of in for the kind of funny Game of the Year. I think I, I think <clears throat> right now, and I'm not I'm at Bowser's Castle in Mario. I think I like Mario more than I liked Zelda, and I loved Zelda. So at, at that point, I think it comes down to largely a matter of taste, don't you think? Because they're well, both sure. so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, I, I can't speak to Horizon, but I do think that if you ask me right now, Zelda, I, I, a few months ago, or even a couple of weeks ago, I would have said, I, I did on this show, so it's Breath of the Wild. It's yeah. Breath of the Wild. There's yeah. nothing else, because it's so good. Um, and I knew that Odyssey would, you know, they very rarely fail on these games like but maybe it could have been a sun another sunshine or a game that sure. people like less that's just like but yeah. it's not it's absolutely i think probably it's top tier one of the best mario games of all time absolutely phenomenal and now i think between zelda and mario it's a coin flip between the two it's gonna yeah. be very very hard to pick, pick between i was two. talking to tim about it the other day for me i think the difference here and why i think i want to put mario in front of zelda is just the fact that i love them both Mario is pure joy the entire time. Yes. In Zelda, I'm just, and I'm not even saying often, but enough. There'd be times of like, wait, I dropped the stick I wanted to use. I dropped the sword. Right, I right. do this. I'm like, oh, this is a cumbersome. What am I supposed to? Okay, there it is. And I'm talking about like out of the, however many hours I played Zelda, I beat it, you know, begin and all that stuff. A few times this happens. But I mean, Mario literally is, I jump in and it's just like, Either it's 15 minutes or it's, you know, multiple hours all night long sitting there just playing if this there game is, and so, if, if, in, so if, in love with it. If the metric and everyone obviously has their own different philosophy, but if 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 you're if you're saying, okay, here's what makes a great game, I want something that is just a pure de pure delight to play yeah. every minute, just the, the constant joy of, oh my God, that happened, or you can do that, and just delight of discovery and exploration. And basically the, the, the sense of like you're playing a game with like a constant goofy smile on your face. Yep. Super Mario Odyssey is the game of the year. Yeah. There's nothing that even comes close to it. But this is where I always come down with game of the year is the fact that you put 
Horizon, Zelda, Mario into the game, PUBG into the game of the year conversation. I think it always comes down to a coin flip, right? Of personal preference. You yes. have to look at all of those games and be like, at the well, end, what works for By me? the end of every year, there are a few games that are all so fantastically good that the only daylight between them is your own personal biases and preferences. Yeah. And that's why, you know, people end up, you know, when Giant Bomber or whatever get together at the end of the year and have their, their, big, giant their, big, their big giant <laughs> argument, it comes down, it often comes down to personal preference. Because you can't say, oh, well, but Mario's not really that good. Like, no one with any brain or any understanding of video games would say, Mario Odyssey is not that good. Anyone can see that it is phenomenal. Yeah. And so it just comes down to, I don't personally like that. Like one of the reasons why I love Odyssey is I love that it's that they moved away from the, the, the different style, sub, sub styles of Mario games. Right? There's one way, okay, here's a bunch of seconds on the clock. There's a flagpole at the end, go. And there's a sense of like constant, and a lot of the games almost have that kind of like the screen's always like pushing you forward. And there's a sense of like pressure and sure. movement. I got to keep moving forward or I'm going to, you know, or I'm going to die. Some people really respond to that kind of Mario game. Um, I mean, it's been that way since the very first Mario, Super Mario Brothers. Um, I personally much prefer the style of open-ended exploration, and I don't feel the time pressure, and I can go, oh, what's over here? Yep. Oh, my God, there's a whole hidden area over here, and I can explore and discover and play the game at my own pace. That's the kind of Mario game that I love, and Odyssey is all that, yep. and I just love it. I was talking you know, on the Bombcast with Jeff about it yesterday, and it was the fact that there is no wasted space there's no there's no corner like I'll, I'll be playing the game and i'm like there's the objective but there's just a patch of green over there a new platform that's i shouldn't jump to why would i and you jump over there and you even if it's just invisible coins that are there yeah you're rewarded everything for is exploring. there everything is there for a reason yeah exactly and and the same again the same is true of um uh, Zelda. Are yep. we missing anything? Like, what what else would you put? We're talking about. I would, so, I, for what, me what's personally, what's in that top tier? So, it's. I think it's Zelda. I think it's Horizon. I think it's Mario. I think PUBG needs to be PUBG in the conversation. PUBG is going to be in the conversation. I know a lot of our audience says Persona Five needs to be in the conversation. Okay. And I and I I've, I'm only 25 hours into Persona Five, so uh, I know I haven't started it, but near people always want near to be talked about in this. But that, this is where we start getting into. I definitely think these games are the ones that you want to give the nod to. You want to be able to say they were a game of the year nominee. I don't know personally, and I haven't played near that it can get up to that level, right? right? Of like it's competing with Mario, but it's one of these outstanding games of the year that needs a tip of the hat. I mean, the other thing about it is just just the broadness of the appeal. Like if someone said, "I'm getting a Switch tomorrow, and I'm I, I, I can afford one game to get with it," what would I get? I'd say Mario, of course. And and again, Zelda by some standards might be the better game. I, I, actually, I would say, like, what kind of games do you like? Exactly. Because maybe if they, like the Zelda, if they like the style of Zelda more, I'd point them in that direction. And, but, but that's the thing, right, is that I feel like Mario is a game anybody could pick up, play, and enjoy and have something to it. Where Zelda, I do think there is a, do you like open world? Do you like this? Are you looking for a story in your open world? Kind of, whereas Mario is just like, hey, run around and get stuff and have fun playing it and take, what, what's going to happen when you take over this? What goofy costume are you going to get? What's hidden behind that Oh my wall? God, so my wife is playing it more than me right now and every time, whatever the the kind of the signature capture is yeah. on each world. Like she got to the world a couple of days ago where you capture the caterpillars that can kind of like oh, yeah, extend. Yeah. So it, it's, I, I remember thinking when I first saw that dynamic of the hat can become things, I remember thinking they might have jumped gimmick. the shark. Yeah, this yeah. might be one gimmick too many, but it's not, it's brilliant. And it gives each level it's unique. Mm -hmm. There's a different approach to gameplay in each level based on what your capture is. And the, obviously the levels and the puzzles are all structured around can you okay so you can stretch here or over here you know you've got you can jump really high or whatever and each level is 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 built around whatever the specific capture you know, what are what are the properties you inherit when you capture this character just as a, again game design masterclass just yeah. absolutely genius yeah and, and again there's that sense of like every minute you're playing it you've got that silly grin on your face because you're just having so much fun exactly and it's, it's discovering the new little intricacies have you done the food world or whatever where the, you're the no, chef no we're getting comes from? we're getting there we just got done with um uh, New Dark City. Okay. And we're on whatever the next what a great world is ending. after that. What a oh. great ending. I don't and, I, and again, I thought that New Dark City was... I know a lot of people complained about like kind of an, the fully kind of anthropomorphic humans and it didn't feel like... Um, somebody said to me one of the complaints against it is there's no consistent aesthetic. Yeah. That each world feels very, very... I actually love that. And he, even though New Dark City is... It is a bit jarring at first. Wait, he's in like the quote-unquote kind of real world here. Yeah, and these people yeah. actually look like real people. Um, but just little things like how the how the uh, the question blocks are on the, the yep. street lights, yeah, yeah, yeah. just you know on the crossing, it's just little things you just want to go like, oh my god, like what a nice little touch. So and it's so like great. every five seconds with that game, there's something. You go, oh look at that, it's so cool. I love, I love it. it. It's exactly. God bless Nintendo. Love it. Are they going for food? Get, have them get me food. Yeah.
Uh, I'm sorry. I got a tight schedule. We've gone long because we're having a great show. I don't want to stop it. Now, here's the thing you need to understand. Yes. About you joining a full time now. Every t- every show, I'm gonna kick to you out with a little funny thing after this segment. Okay. And I'm gonna say where would I where where would I, where would I go to know what came to the mom and grop shops? And then you have to read all these lines. Just this stuff here. You want me to read this what's in bold here and then this yep. list of games? No, no, just just the what's in bold. I'll take it over from there because it's okay. a little jingle so and stuff. Is so this, on, the, we'll is this the it job of the permanent co host to read yeah, this yeah, line? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Do you exactly. want me to read it now? No, no, I'm gonna set you up. Hold okay. on. I'm getting ready to tee it up. Ready? All right, I'm learning on the job here. So, Gary, I'm super excited for PUBG on Xbox One, but it's still a ways out. If I wanted to know what came to the mom and grop digital shops today, where would I go? The official list of upcoming software across each and every platform, as listed by the Kind of Funny Games Daily show hosts each and every weekday. Yeah. Uh, out today, Sokoban Next on Vita. Kotaku listed as PlayStation 4, but I did some sleuthing. It's, it's, apparently, if it's a, only on Vita. If a Vita game releases in the forest and there's no one there, <laughs> did it actually you can get, go to hell did it actually get released? <laughs> I'll be playing it. Everybody's going to go play the Sokodo. You know what I mean? That's the one it's all about. That's where we're all That's about. That's the only release today? Apparently. Slim pickings. Hey, what's what? It's Wednesday. Yeah, and it's a Wednesday. Tuesday was right there. You got Call of Duty on Friday. There's a million things happening. Why is that releasing on? Is Friday the new Tuesday? What's, what is it's, that? I think Friday's the new, hey, we have a block blust, bl- block, a block, <laughs> block a, a block bluster. <laughs> we got a block bluster over here. This, we got this crazy game that's going to go mainstream, we think. Everybody wants it for the weekend. What's the early word on that? I haven't heard Call any. Call of Duty World War II. I haven't heard any. That's, uh, okay, you showed is there, me. Is it, um, when's it, I guess the embargo is up. What? Soon this week, sometime. Probably tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's. You can tell it. we didn't get a copy because I don't even. I'm like I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's happening with it. Uh, it's coming up soon though, so there you go. It's got to be out. You'd assume. You were showing me videos today leaked from Europe of a uh, loot boxes. Loot boxes landing on, on Normandy, Normandy Beach. Beach. What a what a what a what a, what a respectful tribute to the to the countless brave who who died on Normandy Beach. To shower players with uh, with uh, microtransaction loot boxes. There, there are cards to play a little bit further. Yeah. Anyways, we got new dates for you. Uh, PUBG is officially coming to Xbox One's early access program on December 12th. It'll be out of early access on PC in late so December. December is a big month for PUBG. Yeah, exactly. Which really screws people over if they were going to do that thing of like, well, it is an early access on PC, so we can't put it in I am here. so interested and invested in how the Xbox version of, of PUBG is. Um, because as much as I love it, I think part of the reason why I crept away from it was was I'm just lazy and I'm yeah. sitting at home I talked about this before the show and like my PC is in my office which is in a totally different part of the house and like I kind of want to play PUBG but I got to cl- I got to go all the way downstairs get you know set up my headphones and yeah. my and turn on the PC and I'm like isolated from the rest of the house I just don't want to do it but if it's on Xbox and I'm watching TV and I just press a button and I'm playing PUBG frictionless Maybe that's my way back into battle. Jack games. Walkley wrote in to kindoffunny.com slash KFGD just like you can and says how well Will PUBG do on Xbox One? He burped in the letter. What do you want me to do? How well will PUBG do on Xbox One? I, like Greg, play on console rather than PC, and have been super excited for PUBG on Xbox One. However, Fortnite's Battle Royale mode came out of nowhere and is already doing what I had hoped PUBG would do for me when it launched. Today, he talks about the release date of 12-12. One group... Looking at the replies, it looks as if there are two loud groups of people responding to the news of the 12-12 release date. One group seems to be PC players mocking the release, and the other console players saying they don't need this game, Fortnite is free, and Fortnite beat PUBG already. What do you think is going to happen, guys? I think I'm going to happily buy this on Xbox One and actually be playing my Xbox One pretty consistently. I was telling you, what I, I have the Xbox One X at home now that, from the kind of funny that I'm yeah. screwing with. I, when this inevitably happens, I plan on bringing the Xbox One S to work and put it on my desk. And you're a pony. I am a huge pony. <laughs> I ride Shuhei Yoshida. If Battlegrounds yeah. can get ponies, yeah. so the Xbox. We talked about this, we, we talked about this many times from the Xbox and the PlayStation. There's so few games that make the difference like yeah. format exclu- the, 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 the idea of like the format exclusive like you know halo over here and what, what does playstation have nothing nothing oh right? wait everything that's right they have everything <laughs> my apologies all sorts of stuff resistance is no. that is that coming back no they're not no resistance. uh gran turismo yeah it's out yeah that's uh, out right now what uh, you, hurra- you're being serious horizon, Hur- okay, Bloodborne, horizon. uh you know they the new sucker and that's a, and that's a lock solid that that would never that would never be on xbox no okay. death stranding you're gonna go you know what i mean we keep going that way it's spider-man Right, right, right. So days gone. Detroit. Those those games that you can lock down and say, hey, if you want to play this game, you can only play over here. There's those games are few and far between. Battlegrounds is clearly one of those games. I think Microsoft made a very smart decision, backing up the money truck and saying, come here, come here. We want you. We know you can be a needle mover. There obviously will be Battlegrounds 
there'll be a Battleground Special Edition Xbox that'll be painted if in they're some... smart, they better look like do a that, frying yeah. pan or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> it comes You'll have with a handle, a, you'll have a big handle on the end or something, <laughs> and you can whack people with sure. it. Or a frying pan controller. They'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, all of those things are going to happen. Um, I'm very... A lot of it's going to depend on what, how well did they adapt it. A lot of people have talked about well, how well... You know, yeah, that's a good how point. How well are the controls going to map so. to the controller? Uh, will you be able to do the precise aiming and stuff? The early word that I've heard from people is that they've actually done it quite well. Um, I, I really hope that it, uh, they've done it uh, well because I'm very invested in playing it. But I do think it has the potential to, again, once the holidays come around and a lot of people are out there, well, which one are, where I'm going to go? Oh, I've heard PUBG Battlegrounds. I've heard about that. That's supposed to be the shit, right? Yeah. Xbox. Yeah. I think it'll be interesting, yeah, for the people who are the ones who've been on the fence about the Xbox One X or whatever. Like, people who are like, oh, I have a PlayStation 4, I'm set. There's this, and then the promise of whatever Xbox is going to do down the line. Maybe now, you want to play some Cuphead. What the Fortnite guys have done is is obviously pretty cheeky, right? They saw sure. that Battlegrounds was... Uh, was was going viral essentially, yeah. And they they already have a game out there. Can we adapt this very quickly and beat them to market? They did. It seems like people are liking what they did. If I was Brendan, I'd be a little bit irritated oh, that sure. they've done that because they, you know, they they've copied my game and now they're eating our like. So people are saying, oh, we don't need it. We've got Fortnite. Yeah. Wait until Battlegrounds comes out and we'll we'll see. It's going to be a movement. I think that you'll see a lot of people flocking to it and talking about it and wanting to play. And I think it'll be big. Uh, I got bad news for you over on PlayStation 3. DC Universe Online is shutting down on January 31st, 2018. You can still, of course, play it on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. But a sad day for one of the places it started on. Owlboy is coming to PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Switch on February 13th. And then there's going to be a Nintendo 2DS Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time uh, 3D version that comes out for 80 bucks. Uh, it's got its own. It's a green uh, Nintendo 2DS with all this other stuff. You're hanging out and doing it. There you go. It's okay. So the 2DS is coming pre-installed with Ocarina of Time 3D. Yeah, that's What's it. What's wrong? Something feels wrong about that. Yeah, it's a confusing thing to do. Did later. Nintendo give up on 3D? Because I know there are... <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It never, it, ne it never really took on in any iteration, no, did it? No, I used to, I Nobody have a 3DS, it. but I always turn that slider right down. It never really appealed to me, the 3D part. Nobody wants that. And then they're also putting out The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild Explorer's Edition, a bundle that includes the critically acclaimed and award-winning Nintendo Switch game, a 100-page Explorer's Guide, and a two-sided map. For a suggested retailer price is 60 bucks. Deals of the day for you. PlayStation Plus games have been revealed for November. Until Dawn, Rush of Blood is coming to PlayStation VR. This is outside of the realm of the usual PlayStation Plus. It's, or Plus. it's going to be November 7th through January 2nd. So a long time to pick that up. What is Rush of Blood? Is that like a different, an, an Until Dawn type experience, but built just for VR? It's what it is. is a, It's a shooting gal. It's an on-rail shooting gallery in VR where you like ride a mine cart and you shoot stuff that pop out and scare you. It's a horror. Yeah, it's it's really fun. It sounds stupid because r until dawn wasn't that at all. But it actually yeah, it. it feels like a, it feels like a weird spin. -off. It was them applying to it, applying the license to, to this. It was made by Supermassive, so it's cool and it's polished, and everybody really likes PlayStation's it. PlayStation's decided that until dawn is like our horror franchise. So exactly, it makes sense to slap the label on it. Okay, hundred percent. Then you, what happened? Uh, what do I want to eat? Uh, spicy tuna. Just put. You know what I like. I can't stop the show for lunch. Worms Battlegrounds is coming to PlayStation 4. Bound is coming to PlayStation 4. Our type Dimensions is on PS3. Ragdoll, Kung Fu, Fists of Plastic is on PS3. And if you didn't play that, don't. I remember playing that back in the day. No. PS3 is still, so still seeing new releases, still slugging away. No, no, no. This is just PS Plus. This is just them giving oh, away free games for just, it. Okay, but I guess new, games do free. come to PS3. Uh, Dungeon Punks comes to PlayStation 4. Vita, sorry. Vita. This is crossed by PS4. And then Broken Sword 5, The Serpent's Curse, Episodes 1 and 2 are available on PlayStation Vita as well for the month of November. All around kind of weak month, but got to put it out there. Also, right now, there's also the PlayStation Plus double discounts. A whole bunch of games like the Mega Man Legacy Collection 2, Kingdom Hearts, Horizon Zero Dawn are all seeing double discounts for PlayStation Plus subscribers. That ends November oh, so here's, 7th. So here's, here's my chance to get into right Horizon there. Zero Dawn. Are you Dawn. a PlayStation Plus member? Yes. 44% off. And you'd be, right, you'd be right there. You'd be all set for uh, next week's DLC. Frozen Wilds oh, comes out yes. next week. Yes, 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 yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And the PS4, the Pro optimizations, they just they, that just comes in the form of, of a free update, right? Yeah. When they yeah, yeah. upgrade them for Pro. Yeah, I think there might, I've never used, there might be, you go into the settings, or you, yeah, you maybe go into settings. Some games you have to go into the settings and opt in and say, enable Pro, whatever the right, hell it okay. is. Right, okay. But yeah, once you're there, it's already Good to there. know. Yeah, the 4K era begins for me tomorrow, so I'm very excited about what's out there. Yeah. It's going to be a whole new world for you. How yeah. big is this 4K TV? 65. Hoo -wee. Yeah, yeah, it's a biggie. Yeah, that's what you want. That's what yeah. you want. Very excited about Did it. it. Now, I'm not, you don't have to give me the price. Did it set you, are these things still ridiculously expensive or yeah. are they coming down? Yeah, yeah I, I was like, uh, yeah. but I had my current TV for like seven or eight years. All right, uh, yeah. It's getting a bit clunky. 
Um, and I feel like the tipping, I mean, we're now, I feel like just at the beginning of the viability of with the One X, um, PS4 Pro, and you go to the store now and all the big releases are, all the big movie releases are in 4K. I feel like that, that tipping point it, there's not still not a ton of content. You're tip but, of the sword, but, though. You're, yeah. There's content yeah. there for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Time to squat up. This is where one of you writes into kindoffunny.com slash KFGD. You give me your name, your username, your platform of choice, and what game you need help in. I read it here. The best friends find you and everybody plays games together. Mm. Today, Drew wrote in. He needs help on PlayStation 4. His PSN handle is the underscore Prince 09. I think I might have played Friday the 13th with him last night, but I'm not sure. What's up, everybody? Doesn't it suck when you and your friends start getting older, so finding time to game together is difficult? Between work, significant others, getting different consoles, drifting away from games, breaking up while destroying... Wait, what? Breaking up while deployed, so your girlfriend keeps your consoles. Damn, that one sucks. And more. A lot of stuff can get in the way. I've been into single-player games more recently, but want to get back into multiplayer. I picked up Friday the 13th, Elder Scrolls Online, WWE 2K18, and soon we'll have Battlefront 2. I also have Injustice 2, Tekken, Overwatch, and Uncharted 4. If any of those sound fun, hit me up on PSN. Hell, we can even just add each other and never actually play. It's all good. Thanks, Kind of Funny and the Kind of Funny best friends. Hashtag, let cool Greg host. Everybody on PS4, hit up V underscore Prince 09. Become his friend, play those games. Have some fun. I might have to hit you on a squat. Like, I don't know what the next one would be. Like, there's a period I was desperately looking for people to play Destiny 2 with. You couldn't um, do it? I could have cut, I could, but now, I, now I've got a regular slot. I can come up on the show and say, you can, you I, can, need, I need to squat up. There you go. We can squad you up next, next week to Wednesday. It's All easy. Right. Uh, and we're now going to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. This is where you, the people watching the show live on Twitch, write in to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong and tell us what we screwed up as we screw it up so that. We can set the record straight. How'd you do? Listen. I say how because I know I did great. Know. I'm asking how how did how did you do? Uh, he's mad at you. Who is? Neo Aoshi wrote writes in and says, "Hey guys, welcome aboard, Gary. Just so you know, Mario Odyssey is two player. Share the joy with a friend. Well, when you play you as can, the other person can play the hat, but that's it's still <laughs> local <laughs> local single player. Just put it out there, just saying that you know that, that, it wasn't perfect for I, you. I'm, I, mm, thumbs down. on Apparently, that one. Tim yesterday asked for homework on uh, Pokemon stuff." Like how many Pokemons there's been. And now there's a huge fight in there with Capitalist Pig and a bunch of other people trying to debate how many there actually have been. So I'm not going to get involved with that one. I don't want to get into it. I just said I'm not going to get into it, Kevin. Capitalist Pig did write in and say Christine Lakin's character was Jane in The Walking Dead Season 2. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Capitalist Pig comes back and says, wait. Yeah, no, that's what I said. That I don't I don't don't accept that correction. Because he's saying that the PlayStation 4 has shipped 67.5 million. I'm saying yes. That's what I said. Yeah, that is what you uh, said. Thank you. Okay. You made that clear. And then that I wanted to know how many had set, stores, how many had gone beforehand. Houses. That's all. Um, uh, no, because I said they had. Remember, that's not sold through. I said the exact opposite of that. Kev, yeah, Kev. I mean, anytime you go to Best Buy or whatever, and you see a big pile of Playstations, those are those are all those Playstations are that have been shipped, yeah. but no one's bought them yet. Talk in your microphone, or I guess you can hear yourself. But if you're gonna be, if you're gonna give me a real correction, I need you to talk in the microphone. I, I thought you had said afterwards that they had sold 65 as well, which I thought was weird. But I, I, I thought I said that last time we got, yeah, was 65 million. And you're oh, okay. The last time. Okay, we okay, heard, okay. Yeah. So you're saying the, the, so. What Capitals Pig is saying that he's saying that last time we had a check in on this, but he's saying September 30th. That can, shipped whatever. Fuck it. Video games are dumb. Yep. Nailed it. Nailed uh, Kev Kev 330 says, Hey Greg, just a quick update on Xbox One sales from a Business Insider article. Quote, Though Microsoft stopped reporting sales numbers of its Xbox One console numbers provide, I'm sorry, uh, of its Xbox One console, numbers provided by Super Data Research indicate Microsoft has sold approximately 26 million Xbox One consoles as of January 2017. So do you think that the, 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 the it could be like, in terms of installed, it could be like two to one PlayStation Xbox? Seems like it, right? That That's big? what they're talking about it, yeah. It's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot too. And then here is where it gets the Waterman's throwing a nice name, by the way. The Waterman's throwing out VG charts, which kind of just makes everything up. But they're saying the PS3, the PS4 has sold 63.12 million units worldwide. Xbox One has sold 30.97 millions worldwide. But there's no way. Yeah, they're all, and then another one from I'll be that one. But that's it. That's not that bad. Just more clarifications. I, I, pretty good. Yeah, we'll do it. You screwed up the worst. You know what I mean? How did I screw up? With what the, the hat Ma- thing? Ma- Come yeah, on. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a full blown. Yeah, he thing. got you good. Yeah, he got you. They, they nailed you. Don't, I'm not, I'm don't not, trust I, VG. I, I reject that one. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Kind of Funny Games Daily for Wednesday, November 1st, 2017. Thank you for caring, watching, enjoying, welcoming 
new kind of funny games daily show host gary witta i'll come up with a better name for you you don't want to be rogue one anymore i'll come up with something i mean i'm just just call me well now i'm kind of funnies <laughs> yes, they, uh, it's gonna be fun when they, that's the one thing we screwed up if we would have gotten this news out first that could have been put in the telltale release that's right writer of rogue one and and co-host kind of funny, funny chucklehead daily yeah <laughs> uh tomorrow's co-host will be andrew renee making a return to the show i feel like i haven't worked with her in a while um if you didn't know each and every week on a variety of platforms we run you through the nerdy video game news you need to know about before jumping in to your questions comments and concerns giving you perspective answering your questions bad psn names talking to gary and having a good time if you like that you can watch live on twitch.tv slash kind of funny games you can watch later on youtube.com slash kind of funny games or you can listen on podcast services around the globe, no matter where you get the show. Thank you so much for supporting us. Remember, Extra Life, this Saturday, 24 hours of crazy stuff, games, shenanigans, maybe blue hair, all benefiting the Children's Miracle Network. So please, go over there, subscribe, have fun. Until next time, it's been our pleasure to serve you. <laughs>